Welcome to the second panel, Global Supply Chains, Labor Markets, and, and Labor Recruitment. My name is Ed Markham. I'm the Vice President of Investments for Humanity United. Uh, Humanity United is a private foundation started by the founder of eBay, Pierre Omidyar, and his wife, Pam, with a particular programmatic focus um, on issues of, of human trafficking and forced labor. Um, so in keeping with the theme that Nancy put forward to us earlier in the day about trying to identify what works, this particular panel will be discussing key trends, innovations, best practices that are emerging to combat forced labor and supply chains and recruitment um, from a multiplicity of perspectives. We've got sort of business, government, and NGO perspectives on, on, on new approaches that are working. Um, and uh, it's going to be, I think, a very, very rich conversation. It's, also, um, a really interesting moment in time to be having this conversation because it does feel like there's some forward progress and some momentum on this particular issue. Um, and that's for a multiplicity of reasons and trends. Um, as people on the, on the first panel mentioned, uh, there's much higher level of awareness writ large about the issue of, of human trafficking, forced labor, other forms of contemporary slavery. Um, the, the, the difference between you know, aware, high levels of awareness um, today and, and a decade ago is, is just night and day. Um, and it's increasingly seen as one of the most egregious and pressing human rights problems that, that, that we face. Um, uh, there's been some exceptional media coverage as well. We've seen The Guardian, most recently the Associated Press, and a number of other investigative journalists who begin to, begin to break stories um, that are often, in fact, linking tainted supply to the supply chains of Western-based retailers. Um, and that's very much resonating and, and capturing the attention of the corporate world. Similarly, from the policy perspective, there has been a lot of movement, starting with the California Transparency and Supply uh, Chain Act that we talked about, and we will talk about um, some more today on this panel. Um, you've also had the executive order that was referenced. Um, the, you know, the UK recently passed a transparency bill, um, which is sort of a similar disclosure type of, of, of uh, bill that, that um, is then also being looked at. And there are, there are even sort of more progressive legislations in places like Switzerland, France, and Australia. So it seems that wherever you operate, regardless of jurisdiction, ultimately you're going to be forced to disclose what steps you take to address trafficking um, and forced labor in your, in your supply chain. Um, and then lastly, we're seeing some interesting sort of normative and attitudinal shifts. I think the introduction of the UN guiding principles uh, on, on human rights and business, the RUGI principles are beginning to sensitize businesses to their obligation to proactively try to address human rights risks in their operations. Um, you're seeing, I think, a, a shift attitudinally that people are ultimately holding corporations accountable holistically for all of their supply chain, not just for the, the very top tier or you know, within their, their building walls. Um, and. Uh, you're also seeing, I think, some, some interesting movement within, within the investor community. So the mainstreaming of environmental, social, and governance standards um, into, decision, in, into investment decisions, particularly being led in, by, by the environmental side, um, but has provided, I think, an opportunity to begin to insert issues of, of labor practices into how companies are evaluated and how investment decisions are made. So a lot of positive movement. Having said that, this is still a very, very challenging problem. There are no silver bullets. Um, and, um, you know, ultimately there are going to be, you know, a variety of innovations that are required to, to, for, to really truly make meaningful progress in terms of eradicating um, forced labor from supply chains. Uh, you have in, in today's business world, um, you know, very sort of distributed, global, complex, opaque supply chains with multiple tiers of contractors and sub-subcontractors. Um, and it's often virtually impossible to, to assess whether the tens and sometimes even hundreds of thousands of vendors who are in those supply chains, um, you know, are, are, are complying with the appropriate labor practices. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very challenging. It's also um, often prohibitively expensive to, for companies to try to, to, to address that. But, but in fact, there are some groups that are, are paving the way. Um, so with that, let me hand it over to start to, to the panelists here. Uh, we've got an exceptionally talented group of folks, and um, I think it's going to be a very, very rich conversation. I will, um, you know, as, as Nancy alluded to in the beginning, we have complete bios of folks, so I, I will be exceedingly short. Um, so I'll do protocols observed, but we'll, we'll sort of quickly get into the, the conversation. But um, let me start by um, acknowledging Stephanie Richards. Stephanie is the Policy and Legal Service Director at the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, CAST, which, as we've mentioned, was one of the, the founding members of a test and has really been um, essential to its success. 
Um, it, in her role at CAST, um, she provides direct legal services to survivors of human trafficking and technical, technical consultation on human trafficking cases nationwide. Um, next we have Cara Chacon, who's Director of Social and Environmental Responsibility at Patagonia, uh, uh, where she guides and manages the, the sustain, sustainability of their global, global supply chain. Next, we have um, Max Tunyon, and Max is a senior program officer for the GMS Triangle Project, a, a project that aims to strengthen the formulation and implement implementation of improved recruitment and labor protection policies and practices, in particular emphasis on the Mekong region. Um, and lastly, we have um, Leonardo Sakamoto, uh, Leonardo is a, a board member of the Brazilian National Commission for the Eradication of Slave Labor and wrote the Brazilian National Plan for the Eradication of Slave Labor. He is also chairman of Reporter Brazil, an NGO dedicated to the fight against slavery and human trafficking. So with that, why don't I start with you, Stephanie? Um, and you know, as Californians, we're both proud Californians, we like to think that we are trendsetters and what we do then the rest of the nation and sometimes the rest of the world will then follow. Um, in the case of California 657, in some ways that's been true. We're starting to see a number of disclosure and transparency laws replicated around, around the country. You've been involved with the process really from its inception and played an instrumental role in making that legislation you know, come to fruition. Uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about both the past, present, and future. Sort of what was that process look like where do we stand today and where do you see that going? Um, th um, thank you for that generous introduction. I'm very excited to be here today to speak on cutting edge legislative work in California around business transparency and really preventing modern slavery from happening in our own backyards. Um, so I feel privileged that CAST um, was um, one of the original sponsors of SB 657, the business transparency legislation. And we were really fortunate to have um, Julie Armand, uh, who had founded an organization called Asset, um, really come to us and bring th this supply chain issue to our attention. And um, at the time, we, had j we were working with our CAST Survivor Advisory Caucus, and we raised the issue with them and with one member in particular, Flor Molina, who had actually worked in a sweatshop sewing labels into um, very major brands <laughs> um, in, uh, for US companies um, here in California who really said, cast, you must do this. Um, and um, we signed on um, and originally supported the bill. And it was a, a very, even for California, it was a very long road and heavy push. The bill definitely in its inception um, and its original form um, had much stricter enforcement and liability provisions um, than the transparency measures that we ended up with. But, um, and you know, and, and that really was because I think business was not understanding this issue at that time and really hesitant to see modern slavery as an issue that they should be taking on and caring about. Um, and we, you know, frankly, we got very, very strong opposition from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and, um, but we did get initial you know, support from a handful of companies who got it and knew this was their mission. So I just want to call out Patagonia as one of the original um, support uh, for this bill, and also Walt Disney, um, and then Aline Fisher um, as well, after the bill passed, actually hosted a, an event for companies for CAST in New York to sort of raise the profile of it. So we definitely, you know, as I said, needed that strong handful of companies to really um, push the bill through. And I, and I think, you know, from my perspective as an attorney, I was disappointed that there was um, no you know, really strong enforcement mechanisms in this bill. But I think what I've seen in the implementation process is that 
this bill has allowed a dialogue to start with companies that would have never happened. And there's been several um, publications from, um, especially from some major law firms, kind of confirming that uh, this bill has, you know, started a discussion in general counsel offices um, for the major companies that have to comply. And I think for that reason, we've seen companies take huge steps forward in what they're doing to address modern slavery and supply chains. And of course, there's also been much more public awareness, public attention, you know, multiple other things. But I, I, you know, I do think that SB 657 has been a huge part of that mechanism for change. Um, and so, you know, um, shortly after SB um, 657 um, passed in California, you also saw a federal piece of legislation be introduced um, by Carolyn Maloney's office and Chris Smith's office. And that um, bill has, you know, not passed federally, but was uh, modeled around the California business uh, transparency bill and um, is likely to be, it was, re, it was introduced I believe in 2012, 2014 and will be reintroduced shortly in 2015. So we definitely have seen, um, you know, national attention to this issue and with the um, UK bill that just recently passed, international attention and Canada also has been um, looking at similar provisions. So. Um, I always say if we can't pass something federally, we should come back to California and try here. Um, and so I did also just want to mention another cutting edge piece of legislation that I think complements SB 657 um, that was just passed in California last year, SB 447, which involves foreign labor recruiters and it is also a first of its kind piece of legislation that really looks at um, preventing modern-day slavery with temporary workers coming to California. So California gets one-sixth of the temporary workers in the United States, um, so we can have a huge impact on this. Um, and um, basically what it does is allow, uh, have uh, require the California Labor Commission to set up a registration process for workers coming to California um, that their foreign labor recruiters have to register and post bonds, as well as they get a contract in their um, native language that set, states the terms of their employment. There is no fees allowed to be charged for visas in the state of California. And then um, companies are jointly and severally liable if they do not use a foreign re labor registered. So this bill actually has a lot of teeth. Um, and we saw a similar process in the passage of this bill where the chamber was very hesitant to get on board. And this bill, um, the implementation, um, it, it will go into effect in 2016. So I think like with SB 657 where there needed to be a large focus on implementation to make sure it was effective. We That's where we are now, so I wanted to raise that as an issue. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to the uh, Kamala Harris at the Attorney General's office for um, just uh, recently, uh, for SB 657, um, sending out official notices to 1,700 businesses that are required to comply with the California law, informing them about this responsibility, and um, even more significantly, really putting out a great guidance um, on how you can best comply. And I just recently carefully read that guidance and was very impressed with the way that it asked companies to not just comply with the bare minimums of the five reporting requirements, but do more. And also, I felt like um, asked, like use their um, their legal uh, assessments to say it should be interpreted as broadly as possible in what was required under the reporting requirements. Um, and in that, they also mentioned the connection with foreign labor recruiters and. Um, how companies can do better disclosure around that. So I just thought that, um, you know, it, it, it did take um, three years <laughs> to issue these regulations, but, but I think that shows the complexity of this issue and that it is a new issue and that everyone's just grappling with it, whether it be government um, or private sector companies um, and NGOs figuring out how do we um, use these new mechanisms to assert the best pressure. So I will, I think I kind of talked maybe a little too long, so I'll stop there and, and see to other people. No, thank you, Stephanie, that's great. Um, Carol, let me go to you. Uh, Patagonia, with initiatives like the Footprint, Chron Footprint Chronicles, 
um, an example of where you trace inputs into products all the way down to the raw material has really distinguished itself um, as a, a, a leading corporate actor on sustainability issues broadly, but on labor issues in particular as well. And my question to you is, how did you get there? What was that journey like? How did the, what were some of the, the obstacles and challenges? And um, how is it that now there's such a significant commitment within Patagonia to, to proactively address some of these issues? Yeah, so uh, Footprint Chronicles was uh, an idea of some of our um, sustainability team back in 2007 when it was launched. And uh, it was a, an effort to get to radical transparency. Uh, we are the owners and founders of our company, the Chenards, uh, very much support getting both the good, the bad, and the ugly out there. And uh, they want to talk about it. They don't want to just talk about the great things we're doing, but also our challenges and where are we failing, where are we succeeding. And so uh, in 2007, we launched Footprint Chronicles, and it was um, more environmentally uh, focused, and it showed the footprint of a, a product, uh, 17 products. And then we, uh, we launched uh, Footprint Chronicles uh, 2.0 in 2011, and I was at the company then, and that was when we launched the Supply Chain Global Map. And we uh, put all of our factories up there with photos, and 15 of them had uh, expanded pages where you could read a synopsis on the audit. And so uh, it was, um, you know, a really important effort. Took a lot of work, and now we're working on the 3.0 version. So hopefully, that'll be out another year. Um, so, uh, you know, with that in mind, with the radical transparency and you know the complete support of our executives and owners, uh, you know, we're able to put a lot of information out there that a lot of other companies, especially public companies, Patagonia is a privately held uh, company. Um, that they're, it's uncomfortable to do. So, you know, tying that into what we're doing with our migrant worker program in Taiwan, um, we're starting to speak about that publicly. And uh, so this is a, probably, I think, our third conference that we've spoken about this issue. And we have found human trafficking in Taiwan at our tier two um, raw material suppliers. These are our fabric suppliers. And um, it's in almost all of our supply chain there. And uh, it was very disturbing. We found that in 2011, and um, we brought it to the attention of our executives. And there was not even a hesitation. We got the funding. We got staff. And uh, Twee and I, she's sitting out here, and I have to give Twee a shout out. She has done all the work. And our field manager in Taiwan, Rita Sang, are amazing people. And I, I call them the changing the world. <laughs> they have the changing the world jobs. Uh, and uh, um, we've just been diving in, and you know, I'll probably be able to get into the program a little, maybe in another question, but that's kind of our journey. Great, thanks so much. Max, um, recently the world's attention has started to focus on labor exploitation in the Thai seafood sector. There have been a number of articles, The Guardian broke them a year ago, then more recently the Associated Press broke some articles. Um, most of the people who are on those boats are migrants from the, that, that area of, of Southeast Asia. Um, I think that we all are aware of the exploitation that takes place on boats, but something like 90% of all the people who are in those, in those jobs are, are from Laos, Burma, um, Cambodia. Uh, and I know your, your program works on issues of recruitment and flows of labor in, in the region broadly. Um, tell us a little bit about what your project does um, and, and what kinds of innovations as well that you're, start, you're seeing in, in, that, in that particular space. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ed, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be here. Um, as Ed mentioned, I'm uh, based in the ILO's regional office in Bangkok, uh, working on a project in the Mekong sub-region and in Malaysia um, on the protection of migrant workers and the protection in recruitment and the protection in employment. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Southeast Asia is a rapidly growing and rapidly integrating economy with intentions at the end of this year to form an ASEAN economic community, which would be the seventh largest in the world, the population of 625 million people. So it's a significant market and we're seeing greater attention uh, on the types of um, investments that are being made and, and how those link into the global supply chain, particularly in the seafood industry, a $7 billion industry in Thailand alone, uh, but also the palm oil sector uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia, 
um, the electronics uh, industry in Malaysia, garment sector, etc. Um, we've uh, done a lot of work uh, in sea fishing and seafood over the past few years. Um, this began um, a few years ago with a study looking at conditions on board uh, fishing vessels, um, where we found that 17% of uh, the sample were in a, situ a forced labor situation. Uh, the majority of this 17% were not forced or coerced in the traditional sense of being uh, physically um, uh, restrained in their movements, but rather um, most of them were forced because of withheld wages. Uh, and so what we've been working with the Thai government and civil society organizations and the industry association has been to strengthen particularly uh, the issue of, of wage protection in, in Thai law. So late last year, after a number of years of, of, of work, working on this issue, uh, the Thai government introduced greater protections in the fishing sector for, for workers, which raised the minimum age from 15 to 18, acknowledging it as a hazardous sector of work, uh, requiring written contracts, uh, require, uh, uh, introducing the minimum wage into the fishing sector, whereas it pre previously hadn't been. Um, and introducing a number of other measures related to rest hours, occupational safety and health. Um, to ensure more effective application and enforcement of the law, we're also working with labor inspectors, training labor inspectors on identification of forced labor, child labor, uh, developing specific guidelines for inspecting fishing vessels in an area in which labor officers traditionally haven't been um, carrying out inspections, uh, how to work more closely with other departments, and actually, in 2013, bringing over uh, three Brazilian labor inspectors to show how they do their work. Uh, you know, obviously, it's, uh, the work of Brazil has been highlighted globally, and, and even um, in the maritime sector, getting guidance from how they're they're conducting their inspections, um, which was which was incredibly useful. Um, it's uh, very difficult. There's massive corruption, there's massive irregularity uh, of, of fishing vessels, you know, a lot of vessels don't have licenses, um, uh, not registered. Um, that's one of the major reasons why the EU uh, just a couple of days ago issued Thailand with a yellow card, which indicated that um, if uh, improvements weren't made uh, to combat illegal and unregulated fishing in Thailand, then there would be a, a suspension in, in um, seafood exports or imports to the EU, uh, which you know uh, come to nearly 600 million euros. So it's a, it's a major market for, for Thailand, and we're seeing that these pressure from trade partners, but also the pressure from uh, buyers and in the supply chain and are having effect uh, and are causing um, the governments in the region uh, to take a look, a closer look at their laws around uh, sending workers abroad and also sector-specific protections. I can go on. <laughs> if you want to go a little bit more, yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 So um, what we're doing around recruitment in particular is um, uh, looking at not only what are the, the guidelines for licensing uh, recruitment agencies, but also making sure that these agencies are accountable. Um, introducing complaints mechanisms, introducing uh, measures like the joint and um, solidary liability clauses, uh, which exist within the Philippines but currently nowhere else in the region. Um, introducing measures through which workers can be um, receive damages from the, the guarantee deposits that uh, recruitment agencies take out. Um, and also looking at uh, caps on fees in, in Asia, not just Southeast Asia, but South Asia as well, there is it's, it's a very entrenched uh, practice of, of collecting recruitment fees, and recruitment fees are high and significant um, and, and lead to situations of debt bondage. Um, we are working with the World Bank on developing methodology, a methodology to measure migration costs um, uh, so that we can, again, show more transparency uh, around what these costs are, where they are incurred, Oftentimes it's in the countries of origin, but it's also in the countries of destination like Thailand, Malaysia, Taiwan. Um, and in particular, we're seeing um, uh, Vietnamese workers uh, uh, often paying the most uh, in terms of recruitment fees. And for Taiwan, you know, jobs, uh, visas going for $6,000. Um, so we're, we're conducting studies in certain corridors. We're also promoting different types of recruitment, uh, not just going from private recruitment agency to private recruitment agency, 
but also promoting government-to-government -government mechanisms that cut out the, uh, the intermediaries. And this has been already le um, led by Korea in their employment permit system. They uh, receive workers from 15 countries around Asia, and uh, it's only the government departments that are involved in that. And it's quite heavily subsidized by the Korean government, but we, we see this as a, an investment up front in the protection, in the prevention and protection of workers before they get to an exploitative state. And also we're seeing uh, other pilots around the region um, begin to take hold. Bangladeshi workers going to the Malaysian palm oil sector before we're paying $4,000 for a job uh, under the recruitment agency's uh, system. Now in a government-to-government -government system, they're paying only $400, so a decrease tenfold. Um, the other initiatives that we're uh, also looking at um, piloting and, and rolling out further relate to self-regulation tools and incentives for recruitment agencies um, to adopt principles such as no, no recruitment fees and, and other protections. So in Vietnam, for example, we work with the industry association, the Recruitment Industry Association. We have a code of conduct, but we also have a, a means to monitor the application of the code of conduct and give rankings to um, 50 agencies that account for 70% of the workers going abroad. Uh, and these, uh, these rankings are issued according to their compliance with the, the agencies. And we hope that we're, we can tie this, uh, that we can raise awareness among employers uh, and also the buyers of, of, from these um, employers of the recruitment, of, of the ranking system so that they'll uh, seek out um, the agencies that have been uh, recognized for their good practices and that there's more incentive to participate in this initiative. Okay, great. Thanks, Max. Leo, I have a, a simple but I think very expansive and important question for you, which is you, you played an instrumental role in the development of the Brazilian National Plan and the Pact. And from your experience from its inception through to today, what in that it, do you think is generalizable um, and what types of best practices might other countries, states, take away from that, that that could be applied to their context? And what, what do you think is sort of unique to the Brazilian context? First of all, good morning for everybody. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, if you don't mind, I will speak in Portuguese too. Olá. <laughs> um, bem, uh, Primeiramente, acho que vale a pena falar que a nossa organização, a Repórter Brasil, nós é, atuamos no rastreamento de empresas globais, 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 de networks that were tracked by our organization. There are many agreements, many pacts that all ended up that came up, and many companies developed actions of social responsibility for the business people. We do it a certain way. From the companies that use exploration of workers, we verify where the, their products are going. So, reportage that came out of the United States and Europe about this uh, productive uh, network that was with, from our help to uh, report that. What's important to talk about, even to answer your question, is that first, the companies, they, no, no company, I mean, I'm not going to say no company, but almost no company wants to spend money with res social responsibility. As a matter of fact, many companies think that it's possible to do, to do it for free, the, the, the social responsibility for the company. It's almost like a favor that they do for the society. And I'm sorry who thinks like that as an idiot, because it's impossible for you to establish a pol policy, uh, honesty, and uh, that's lasting. The altered and structural uh, behavior of the company without putting money into it, it's impossible, period. Now, since the companies don't want to spend money, many of them don't want to spend money on the com combating the slave work, then what we have shown is that they're going to lose money in, in case they don't, in fact, that if they don't combat the, the slave work. And that's the other side of the coin, which has been the last few years that we created in Brazil with the action of the public, uh, public and the civil society with the companies. There's a system that's based 
and the dirty list of the slave work. There were public banks and private banks and many companies, international and international, they utilized this data uh, base, so they cut their business ties with them. That is, these companies, they end up losing money because of that. And the other companies, they don't do that because they want to cut the business ties. They don't cut the business ties because they are good people, good. There's no room for morality in the economy. Went off. Either they do that, they do that because of fear of losing resources. Let's be honest. Apple, Coca-Cola, Nike, they don't sell computers or soda pops or tennis shoes. They they sell styles of life. What you what you what you should like, what you should be. Always from coming from the top to the bottom. This style of life, it's always going up. It's always the best of us, right? Which in reality, we don't have the time to live, to be uh, stylish, to be uh, high, uh, to be good in this our free time. So I acquire, acquire products so they, they become what we want. What happens is in this process, there's no room for degradation and slavery. Nobody buys a product to be, well, I'm going to buy this product because I want to look like I want to look like I'm, I'm support the slavery work. I don't want to support the corruption. Nobody buys a product for that reason. So, of course, no company wants to have their brand, which is its most important active linked to slave work. And that's what the company runs away from, from this process. MRV Engineering, it's a big company, a building company, construction company in Brazil, and real estate, when they came up with the dirty list of uh, slave work in 2012-13. Their stocks went down 6%, the stock market in Sao Paulo went down to 4%. In August 2011, in Azara, which everyone here must have at least one piece of clothing from them, they got caught with the slave work in Brazil. In one day, their stocks came down 4% on the Madri uh, stock market in the tax. In the same way, Kuzama, the uh, sugar and alcohol company in Brazil, was caught with the slave work and came up on the third list of the slave work in December of 2009. And next week, in just a few days, just a few days, their stocks dropped more than 5%. In Sao Paulo, and 3.5% in the New York stock market. So we're talking about companies going down because the investors don't want to be involved with a brand that can cause problems. Of course, also, these jobs are seasonal, that we can talk about it later. Uh, sanctional, I mean, seasonal, they last, don't last that long. Then they recoup themselves. But the shockwave is enough to cause uh, a turnaround in, in, in the companies. Even because, see, the department or responsi social responsibility of companies are seen as I, 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 ONGs, NGOs. Whoever works in the exterior department, they see how the department, commercial department looks at you as if you are a foreign entity. A verdade é que the reality, Brazil, it's able to, is able to create the system based on an inspection of the, of the, the work system. We have inspectors, we have millions of, uh, thousands of inspectors with the authority to go into the companies and can farms, verify the condition of the workers, and if it's, if it's necessary to rescue these workers, uh, make so that they are paid, and and uh, give re reports that they become the criminal process and the work, uh, work uh, judicial process for these people. If you don't have a public system, public, state, yeah, for the state, indeed, there's no other way around. Uh, the public system, a strong public system of inspection of the work for this, so that this system can work. So we've seen many auditing, international auditing, they work for textile companies in Brazil, they audit the productive networks, and next week the inspectors of the work come in and 
that the workers go for the same networks. So there is there is no use for you to base all your prop uh, on a private auditing because it's private. The market, in, unfortunately, although there's a belief that it regulates itself, it does not regulate itself in all the aspects. It's necessary to regulate. In the United States, we have regulation, strong regulations in the market. It is necessary for a process to have this regulation. And then I, I, I say that unfortunately, and something we've seen that countries have looked for come to Brazil because they want to duplicate the impact of international the, the com commitment that we made in 2005 to combat the slave work because today it became an institute which was represented by Mercy. We want to create this process that we create in Brazil. We want to create this perception. We need the base to work with inspection of the work for, so you can create bases, uh, database to create, to give inform, uh, reliable information and combat the, this type of crime. Great. Thanks so much, Leo. Um, you brought up quite a bit there. Let me just take one, one um, issue that you brought up, which is in some ways sort of the, the moral versus the business case for change. And I'm wondering if, if Kara, you could talk a little bit about this. Um, again, we talked about internally, it seems like there was a, a real value towards radical transparency. Um, but particularly if you look at, again, even at the ESG space, increasingly you're seeing that there may be even a, a business case. Um, what you manage ultimately um, will, will, can, can pay dividends. In the case of environmental standards, if you have a smaller ca carbon footprint, you use less water, you're more on top of managing what's going on. Ultimately, that's often correlated with outperforming the market and having better financial returns. Um, one would think, similarly, that better labor practices would lead to a more productive labor force with less turnover, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what kinds of conversations have you guys had internally about that business case? Um, and has it been mostly led through just a, a value position, primarily? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so. When we discovered the human trafficking, the, the moral issue was discussed at the highest levels, and that word was used in the meetings, where this is a moral issue and we have to fix it. So how, do, how does Patagonia get to that? I would say that, again, it comes from the owners who really want to do the right thing and raise awareness of these issues. They also want to influence other brands to you know, help them start their journey or continue their journey um, or so that we can learn from them. Um, so I think the interesting thing about us putting our information out there um, in a way that a lot of brands aren't doing, uh, at least not as much as, as we are, um, is really the awareness factor and also to um, show the world that you don't have to hide your problems. And uh, I think the goodwill that has come back to us from being transparent and working on these tough problems, uh, it comes back, it does come back in the form of more sales and things like that. But we don't do it for that reason. I'm being totally honest, because I work with our marketing team all the time. And no one's measuring this, you guys. No one is measuring how much, how many more down jackets did we sell because of the traceable down you know, uh, campaign we just had, or um, because we're working on migrant worker issues, or because we're fair trade. Like, I really don't even know what our fair trade sales are. <laughs> we're just not doing it for those reasons. I know that sounds really strange. Um, but in the next couple years, I am working with a lot of the business units and our marketing team to, to what are those numbers? But I want to know those numbers not for the reasons that you might think, just so to see if we can get more sales. It's more to show the world that um, a people, planet, profit model actually can be profitable and that you can make money and do the right thing and be a responsible business. That's why we want the numbers. Um, we need to put numbers out there so that people can believe in this and aren't afraid to put their problems out there and, and then tackle them bit by bit. I mean, we don't have it all figured out. It's definitely, we struggle every day. It's very stressful. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I think that's, that's 
pretty much what we talk about every day is how can we move the needle forward? How can we help other brands? How can we open the eyes of our consumers so that they vote with their dollars at the cash register and buy for the, the responsible brands, the brands that have CSR programs? And uh, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Leo, anything you'd want to respond to as a result of that? Uh, you want to respond to her, her comments at all? Or we, we can go on to the next topic. Eu tô até com medo de responder porque eu falei bastante já na primeira vez. Então, eu acho que se eu so, I believe if I start uh, talking, I will be, I will be talking much more. But I wanted to just tell something very quick as, uh, about what she said. There was a case um, that was uh, in, um, in the pact in, in the relegation of slavery work. That was a very interesting. A, a company that was using slavery work that had already uh, had been five releases of the slavery of this farm, which is a um, uh, sugar cane. Uh, farm. So she entered in the list of the slavery work on the, of the Association of Labor and, and were, uh, in, in the point of the companies that were uh, doing the ethanol. Uh, so it's the beginning of the pact of the companies that they were, um, they were very surprised of the, the liberations of ethanol in Brazil, as you know, it's uh, struggling uh, that uh, ethanol became is a international commodity, so using, using as a, a, a that ethanol is a full, much more clean than petroleum. So what happens? So more of the distributors that were buying from this uh, that you were uh, buying from this farm that you, uh, that had the ethanol uh, manufacturing. They, they cut the commercialization with this uh, land from this farmland because of the international of the implication international and also in the also within the commerce of ethanol with the slavery work. So this uh, uh, company, this using company, belongs to the most important, important uh, most rich person in Pernambuco, which is the, uh, the north, north east of uh, Brazil. Uh, Los Monteiro is the name. And his brother is the, uh, that's, uh, the minister of uh, the minister of the commercial of uh, international commerce in the ministry. And even though they don't talk, the two brothers don't talk, but they have very good relations with all the estado, politicians of their state, eles, and época, between them, they had all, uh, a, a very good, uh, a very good Brasil, relation with the Chamber of uh, Deputies, uh, Severino Cavalcanti. Um so they made a lobby uh, with the distributors of, of fuel, so they, they start buying uh, ethanol from this uh, land that was using uh, uh, slavery work. So instead of the companies start buying from this farmland, but they worried about the image that they had in the, in the foreigners, which Excel, Exxon, Petrobras, between other ones, they, they, they told to the media, to the Brazilian media, that the, pres the president of the chamber of senators was doing a lobby with this uh, farmland that was using slavery and breaking. De fair trade da, um, dessas empresas. Uh, and breaking e these uh, laws of. Uh, and so they had to. Uh, and this had to, uh, had person had to. Had um, to publicize and, and had to suffer an impeachment because he was very corrupted. But this block of ethanol continued to this farmland. So what is more important in, in the, the determinated situations and under se several processes of legal and structure, it's very important for you to create, create a, a global comportment from the groups, which is behaviors that are solid and consistent, but you need information. does not exist in Brazil. Uh, a fair pact if it's not uh, circulating and, and, and free. Thank you, Max. You'd want uh, Max, to also come in on this issue? Yeah, uh, just to touch on, on the issue of, of the moral case versus the business case. Um, certainly we're seeing in, in, in the region where I work, 
that there is increased awareness of, of how, this, how these measures can uh, contribute to the bottom line. Uh, with recruitment agencies sending workers to the electronics industry in, in Malaysia or Taiwan, uh, they're seeing initiatives like the EICC's the Code of Conduct, which you know, in, introduces new standards, including now um, a no fees, no recruitment fees policy. Um, and that's causing uh, recruitment agencies in a number of countries sending workers to rethink their approaches. They're no longer competing on, 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 on uh, just the, the speed in which they can deploy workers or matching um, uh, the type of uh, workers with the needs of employers, but also on this no fees issue. Uh, they know that if they don't do it, if they don't adapt quickly, then they'll lose their market to, to uh, the Philippines or Indonesia or another country that's more uh, progressive. So I think we're beginning to see more awareness uh, of, among recruitment agencies on that in that regard. And then when we look at the Thai fishing industry, for example, the biggest concern of employers in the fishing sector is uh, labor shortages. The, their industry is uh, estimated to have a shortage of about 50,000 workers. Nobody wants to work in the fishing sector. It's you know uh, the last option um, for migrant workers, not even for, for Thai workers, but for migrant workers, they don't want to work in the sector. So they also see the need to improve conditions and tr introduce uh, better protections in order to uh, attract and retain a, a workforce uh, at the in individual vessel level, but also at the industry level. But I also wanted to, to touch on another point, and it's a point I raised in, at the, in DC, was on one side, it's great that uh, companies are taking these initiatives to clean up their supply chains. But also, I think a lot of the leading industries have a responsibility to come together and work with one voice to put pressure on the governments of certain countries or on uh, industry associations in certain countries to raise the bar and address some of the structural problems that exist. Identify the gaps in the policy and the common practices that allow um, debt bonded situations or, or um, uh, uh, low wages or wage deductions to, to occur and take place. There's, you know, one thing is, is to identify the problems in your own supply chain, but you also have to, to look at you know, the broader issues that take longer to resolve. And this can't be done just on a company-to-company -company basis between the buyer and the supplier. This really requires uh, c coming together and speaking with one voice. And you know, there's a lot of workers, and in particular migrant workers, that are not involved in the global supply chain, but equally or more vulnerable to exploitation. I'm thinking of, of domestic workers or care workers, workers in, in small farms, uh, in the construction sector. There isn't uh, a buyer you know, in the, in the West who's, who's concerned about their rights and working conditions. But there is pressure that you can put on the governments and on the industry associations in countries where you're, you're buying from to improve conditions overall. Max, staying with you briefly and getting back to this theme of innovation, it seems like one of the root causes of challenges that migrant labor has is significant information asymmetries between someone who's about to take a job and someone who's about to traffic them. Are you seeing interesting models emerge? So, you know, I know at Humanity United, for example, you're starting to see vertically integrated labor broker models that take out some of those change which, which create vulnerability when someone goes across border. Um, similarly, technology can be applied in really interesting ways where you begin to have sort of the equivalent of a Yelp for labor brokers where you have a, some sort of reputational assessment of the person you're about to engage within a contract. Are you seeing anything like that play out on the ground within the context of the, of the region where you're working? Um, we don't have the, the Yelp for migrant workers yet. <laughs> I mean, it's a model that, that was actually presented in DC and very interesting and something that I'll be taking back as an idea to share. Um, but, you know, there are issues around access to technology. Uh, I mean, a lot of migrant workers do have phones and smartphones, but it's not, you know, as prevalent as in, in, in many countries. Um, and it really depends on, on, on the nationality of workers or where they're coming from, their background, the sector of work in which they're employed. It depends on their, uh, you know, if they're coming into the country regularly or through legal channels. Um, the, and also there's so many different types of ways in which workers are recruited. Even a regular worker is, you know, maybe recruited through uh, their 
family members or acquaintances at the village level who have no intention on exploiting them, but once they get to the destination country, they are uh, end up in, a, in, in an exploitative situation. You have um, licensed agencies also that are uh, complicit in, 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 in trafficking or exploitation. So really there's, there's no kind of uh, one, one size fits all response. There's so many different types of, of um, processes for, for entering the country, whether it's legally or illegally, uh, and uh, being placed in a job. Um, but there are, what, what, we, what we do see as a major gap is the lack of information that migrant workers have. And so we are working through, uh, we've established a number of migrant worker resource centers in countries of origin and destination. These are in, 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 in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos and Myanmar, uh, in a number of places linked to job centers so that workers who are looking for jobs can find information about the jobs within the country, but also the jobs abroad. And they can get information about you know, what are their rights and where they should go for, for help in case they end up in, in exploitative situations. And we're trying to build a network of these resource centers between countries of origin and destination so that if their family members uh, hear, you know, if they call back their call to their family members and raise a grievance, uh, then those resource centers can contact the resource centers in the destination countries uh, to help resolve the problems, call in the labor officers, call in the police where required um, to help them uh, seek access to justice. Thank you, Stephanie. I think you had a comment. Yeah, um, just to give a little also background on, on this issue in the United States. So um, uh, service providers around the country, like CAST, um, have found that two-thirds of the traffic, labor traffic victims we're serving in our populations are actually coming on temporary visas to work. So they're coming lawfully to the United States. So I think a lot of times people think that it's undocumented individuals who are most vulnerable to trafficking, and they are vulnerable. Um, but we see that our immigration system and the process of our temporary visas, a gamut of different visas, not just the H2A, H2B, visas maybe that you commonly hear about, but a wide range. Um, and so I think that's what's really cutting edge about SB um, 477. It really does say workers should not be charged a fee to come to the US and work uh, on a lawful visa, um, because we were seeing fees of anywhere between $2,000 and $20,000. And for a worker coming from a developing country, this is mortgaging your family's home. This is taking out huge loans from loan sharks. And this is what leads to the vulnerability then to the exploitation that's been happening here. Um, and so I'm very, very excited that we have this new framework that get, says workers coming to California, absolutely, you should know universally, you do not pay a fee. If you do, that's illegal. So hopefully that information will get out to the workers if you're coming to California, right? And then you do have this system of registration that is public, so you can know at least that this is a foreign labor recruiter that's bonded with the state of California if you're coming to California. And then finally, um, you have this enforcement mechanism, which is a huge victory, right? That we don't, just in California, are able to enforce against that foreign labor recruiter who might change their name or disappear or just really um, be impossible, right, to bring actions against um, in the United States. But if that employer, right, isn't using a registered labor recruiter, they can be um, jointly and severally liable. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see when this law goes into effect in 2016, the results. But in my mind, it actually um, takes that comprehensive approach that we really need to see to prevent modern slavery before it happens. And, um, you know, the California Labor Commissioner has been really great at speaking with the test and other groups that are interested in effective implementation of this law, because it really is going to be about the implementation. And the first step is really that businesses need to know, hey, your foreign labor recruiters need to be registered in California, because it's going to be really hard to tell them about a California law, right? But biz businesses in California need that information. Great. Stephanie, again, sticking with you very briefly here. Uh, you mentioned, and kind of going back to 657, in the, in the establishment of 657 and the formulation of that, there was some resistance. 
um, and in the development and formulation of any public policy, you can never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, as you look at that current legislation, um, what would you recommend to other parts of the world, other jurisdictions looking to replicate that, um, that would augment or, or build upon the California legislation um, to make it even more robust? That is a great question. And, you know, given how difficult it was to pass SB 657, we have made the political decision not to touch it for a while because we're afraid that if we push for good changes, we might end up with bad changes as well. Um, so just to put that out there. Um, uh, but things that I would love to see in the bill um, that aren't in there based on my experience with the implementation process would the first and foremost thing is that the uh, California Attorney General's Office and the California Tax, Ch Fans Fr Tax Franchise Board made the decision that the list of companies who have to comply with the law is confidential taxpayer information and therefore do not release the list of companies that must um, comply to the public each year that they receive from the T California Tax Board. And so, um, you know, from an advocacy perspective, um, I think we believe that the spirit and the heart of the law um, was that this list would have been public, and so it wasn't explicitly placed into the law. Um, and so we're very disappointed that um, consumers don't have access to that list, because that makes it easier from a, a public awareness perspective to obviously monitor the companies that have to comply. Um, Humanity United with Know the Chain has done a really good job in putting together a, a list of companies that they believe must comply and have started a website that helps consumers monitor it, but it would be a lot easier if we had that list. Um, and, and our understanding is we need a statutory change for that. Um, other things and improvements that I would make are actually seen in the federal um, bill. So one thing that SB 657 does not do is it only covers manufactured goods and not um, goods and services. And as we know, and especially in our conversations, um, you know, people, labor and services are definitely being exploited. So I think that is the second most significant change that I would, would like to see. Um, you know, just based on CAS personal experience serving clients, you know, Every industry that we can think of is in, in, impacted. I just want to say, here in California, we've seen cases where it's involved, you know, beehive farmers, and a case that involves Christmas trees. So don't think any of your goods and services are exempt. And you know, services in the elder care facility, in hotel work, in restaurant work, and so we're just seeing. Like we're, you know, we're really in LA scratching the tip of the iceberg and the people that are being trafficked here just in LA, but the variety of ways that, that people are actually enslaved in the United States is so diverse. We need, you know, um, we need to be covering more. So I'll stop there. I mean, I could, there's a long, long list. Um, so you can talk to me afterwards if you're really interested in all the changes, but those are the top two. Okay, great. Carrie, I wanted to come back to you. You'd mentioned in your early rem earlier remarks that you had found, for example, forced and bonded labor in your second tier suppliers. I'm curious, what, what's your approach when you find a problem like that? Do you try to work with the supplier, improve their practices, um, and or you simply move elsewhere, and, and how do you make those kinds of decisions? Yeah. So we've taken um, a multi-pronged approach um, that, w that involves a lot of different stakeholders. Um, we created a short, medium, and long-term plan. The short-term plan was to do the research, so we did the baseline audits. Our new audit tool had um, uh, a new human trafficking uh, detection section that replaced our old imported worker section, and that made a big difference. Uh, that was how we were able to identify the issues and the indicators. And uh, from there, uh, we did pilot audits. Uh, we hired Verite, and um, we're continuing those pilot, pilot audits right now. So that's kind of the research and discovery phase. Um, we quick, quickly realized that there weren't any comprehensive uh, migrant worker employment standards out there. So with Verite, our, our third party uh, NGO that's helping us with this, um, they're amazing, by the way. Uh, they helped us write the standards. Uh, they're very comprehensive. Comprehensive. There's about 89 standards that cover the um, recruitment phase, so before hire, 
um, hiring and employment phase and also the repatriation phase. And uh, there, um, we launched those to our suppliers just last December in a supplier seminar in Taiwan. We had our COO there, our um, VP of supply chain, myself, Tui, from the Social Environmental Responsibility Department, and also uh, Rita, our field manager, and also um, Matt Dwyer, our materials um, director. And so we had a show of force, a united um, business and CSR force to show that the, every level in, in our company was behind this effort. Our approach to that um, supplier seminar was one of respect and partnership with our suppliers. Um, that is super essential and key. And uh, it was all about not leaving our suppliers and first educating them. They had no idea this was happening. They knew there were some fees involved um, at the Taiwan labor broker side, so the receiving side, but not the sending side. They had no idea. Um, it was an emotional day. Uh, we, they weren't, there was no hostility. There was just like, let's learn. No one was saying, we're not going to do this. There was a lot of questions about cost. Mm. And we answered them as honestly as we could that we will take each, everyone's um, issues on a case-by-case -case basis, but that we have two deadlines you guys have to meet. Number one, the first deadline is June 1st, 2015. All of our suppliers have to uh, hire directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the second deadline we set was on December 31st, 2015. You have to pay back the fees to the workers that were hired before June 1st that were paid above and beyond the legal limits. And we're right now finishing up our audits, so we're in the medium term phase right now. Um, and uh, we will be crunching those numbers and, and uh, figuring out how much money they owe. We're, we're encountering some resistance. A um, couple suppliers, or I think at least one supplier has said, I don't believe these numbers, we're gonna do our own investigation. Um, we uh, have all of our sourcing team and materials team on the alert to work with the pricing, because we will pay in more if we have to. Um, but it has to be reasonable, obviously. We're not going to just you know, uh, but we have to partner with our suppliers. That's super, super important. Um, if you don't partner with them and you just leave, you cause other social responsibility issues like layoffs. Um, so it's not worth it. If you move the problem somewhere else, another, some other brand will go on there that doesn't have a CSR program and will, you know, this, the whole system will just keep running. Uh, so we're, our long-term plan is to affect system-wide change in Taiwan, not just in our supply chain, to um, Max's comment. Um, that's super important to not just look at your own supply chain, but to help other brands uh, start their journey. Uh, we're going to um, release our standards to the public so anybody can use them. We're gonna be doing that probably in the next couple weeks. And uh, we're already talking to other brands about brand collaboration. Um, we formed a, an informal group to make sure we're all staying in touch. And interestingly, in the first phase, we did bring a forum of brands together and no one was ready to tackle this. Um, there's just a few companies, HP and Apple in the electronic sector that are doing some work around this. It's really great. Um, but the uh, apparel brands are just not there yet and, and for very good reasons. Um, but we're here to show that it can be done. Uh, it's not impossible. Uh, and then the last thing we were doing that we're really um, excited about is our partnership with the Taiwanese government. We met with them back in December as well. Uh, we found a very good partner in them. There's very passionate people that want to eradicate human trafficking out of ta Taiwan. And they, um, we partnered with them in February and they held a free training with our suppliers to teach them how to hire directly from uh, the Philippines and Thailand. And uh, there's government MOUs there between the two countries, and you can hire, there's programs that you can hire direct, no fees. And so they had that training in February. And so we're finding other ways to work with the Taiwanese government to help them. We're going to give them our standards. Um, it was a very, very good conversation. We had no idea what to expect, <laughs> um, but um, we're very pleased with um, how caring they were about the issue. So um, we have a lot of work to do, uh, you know, but we are going for system-wide change in Taiwan, and it will take us a while to get there. 